Hi. So even before the official talk starts, this is uh, Maven Demon. Who of you knows that Maven, Maven Demon even exists? Yes. So the main formation for the rest of you is that Maven Demon exists. It's uh, pretty much the same like for, for Gradle, but just for, for Maven. Uh, it was started by my colleague uh, more than a year ago. Uh, and now it moved to Apache Foundation under the official Maven project, and there's a release already there. And if you want to try, uh, you are welcome. If you find bugs, please report. There's a GitHub repository where you can do it. And I think now it's time to start the talk. So let's talk about uh, porting libraries and frameworks to Quarkus. Uh, my name is Peter Palanga. I work at Red Hat in a team called Red Hat Integration. And there we work on various products that are uh, mostly based on Apache Camo. <clears throat> Who of you knows uh, Apache Camo, by the way? Yes, there are a couple of times. For the rest of you, Apache Camo is an integration toolkit that allows you to create pipeline to exchange data between third-party systems that were not designed to communicate with each other. And Apache Camel offers more than 300 connectors for such uh, third-party systems. And my uh, main job is to port these connectors to Quarkus. And that's so to say uh, my, uh, my qualification for giving this talk, because every one of those connectors embeds some library or some framework. So porting libraries and frameworks to Quarkus is my, is my daily bread and butter. Uh, this talk uh, consists of uh, three main parts. <clears throat> First, there's a Quarkus introduction. Who of you has written already a simple application on Quarkus? Not so many, so it's good that we have a <clears throat> general introduction. Uh, then I will give you a uh, a broad overview about how Quarkus works internally, and the third part, which is uh, the main focus of this talk, is how to write uh, Quarkus extensions. Uh, I really don't expect you uh, to start writing Quarkus extensions tomorrow. It's more like showing you some Quarkus internals uh, so that you better know how, how Quarkus works. That's on one hand, and on the, on the other hand, uh, uh, maybe for you, like for me, it's it's an amazing piece of technology, and I just just like uh, watching this kind of uh, amazing technology. It's like when you look under the hood of a Porsche or Ferrari, right? And I hope uh, I will be able to uh, to deliver this kind of feeling to you during this talk. So let's start with what is Quarkus. I like speaking about Quarkus, uh, uh, like about the build time augmentation toolkit. I don't think a uh, framework would, would be a good uh, classification for Quarkus uh, because Quarkus, Quarkus itself has no strong opinion about uh, how you should write your applications. Uh, things like programming models and frameworks are delegated to Quarkus extensions. So if you want to um, code in a certain way, you need an extension. If you're lucky, the extension exists. If you are not lucky, you may want to write one. Uh, why would we want to use Quarkus at all? First, there are these kind of uh, operational advantages for using Quarkus. Uh, the applications are, are rather small on disk. They are fast to boot, and they, which is important for serverless, uh, when you want to scale up and down very quickly. And um, they have uh, a small compared to other uh, ways of writing Java applications, small memory pool footprint. Uh, but there are not only these operational advantages, there's also dev mode. So you can start Quarkus tooling using NVN Quarkus dev, and what it does is it, that, that it compiles your application that you have in your workspace, it boots the application, but, it's, but it keeps watching for the changes in your workspace, and once you change a Java class or uh, an HTML template, it detects the change, recompiles the application again, and reloads the running application so that you can switch to your browser and check whether it does what it's supposed to. 
and this uh, uh, makes uh, the uh, development iterations uh, really amazingly fast. Second, there's dev services uh, that are mostly implemented using test containers, uh, especially for databases or for Kafka or for, for uh, mock uh, mail, um, mailing backend. Uh, when you have uh, the given uh, extension in your class pass, uh, in your maven.pom.xml file, uh, Quarkus uh, detects that, and uh, unless you configure something explicitly, it just, it just boots uh, a database or a mess messaging broker for you automatically, and it wires it uh, into your application without you having to care for anything. So when you start the, uh, uh, your application in dev mode, the database is simply there. Uh, the end, only dis disadvantage is that on every reload, when you change something in your application, the state of the database is lost. So you have to add entity somehow to test whether it does what it's supposed to. Then there's continuous testing. Uh, if there are tests in your application, Quarkus runs all of them at the beginning uh, when you start the dev mode. But then when, as you are doing changes, it only reruns the tests that are impacted by the change, which again makes it much faster and you see you get the feedback uh, in a much more effective way than if you would be running the tests manually. Good, and uh, then there's DevUI, which looks like this. I hope you can see something for it. Uh, every extension uh, in your class pass uh, that you have in your dependencies can bring a little box to this uh, special dev UI that is served under a special endpoint called uh, slash q slash dev. And for example, for uh, GraphQL, there's GraphQL UI, and for smaller I, open API, there's uh, Swagger UI. Now let's find a way how to get back. Ah, okay. Now let's enter full screen. No. Okay. And there's more for developer joy. Um, Quarkus isolates you pretty much perfectly from the complexity of GraalVM native compiler because it's pre it prepares uh, the, the configuration for GraalVM out of the box, so to say. It's again a responsibility of uh, a given extension to prepare the application for compilation into native image using GraalVM native compiler. Uh, I will show an example later how complicated it could be uh, to, to pass uh, every uh, single configuration option to GraalVM. Uh, and then there are some, some nice Quarkus specific uh, extensions like Panache, which is a simplified uh, object relational mapping and uh, JAXRS for serving REST uh, endpoints. And there's Qt, uh, which is a Quarkus tailored uh, templating engine, uh, which is strongly typed and which is uh, like everything happens at build time. So if you mistype in field name or method name in the template, uh, it detects it and it outputs a reasonable error. Good, when we speak about the extensions, uh, the ecosystem is pretty wide uh, at the moment. Uh, if you come from the Jakarta EE or Java EE space, then the programming will be pretty much the same like you did on Wildfly, uh, EAP, or WebSphere, or WebLogic uh, before. Uh, there's a pretty good support for the new um, micro-profile specifications, and there's some coverage of Spring via compatibility layers. What it means is uh, that uh, the compatibility extension just uh, translates the Spring specific annotations into their uh, micro profile or Jakarta EE counterparts. There's no uh, Spring context running under the hood. So this will probably work in the most common cases, but if you have something very special, be prepared that this is not perfect. And this is mainly uh, thought for people coming from that area so that they don't need to learn the, the other Jakarta -E or micro profile annotations. Uh, all major databases are covered uh, 
including Oracle, which, uh, which is not even listed here, uh, also Kafka, MongoDB, Neo4j, Cassandra, which is also not listed here. Um, and there are some third-party frameworks like Camel, where I'm active, or InfiniSpan, or Hazelcast. And if you want to see the complete list, you can go to codequarkus.io, which is, which is uh, pretty similar to Spring Initializer that we have seen in the previous, um, previous uh, the, uh, talk. Uh, full screen, like this. Okay, and you may ask uh, where all those uh, Quarkus extensions are coming from, and the answer is uh, primarily from the Quarkus core repository that hosts all those database drivers, uh, uh, Java E standards, micro profile, and so on. But there are there's a bunch of independent projects uh, and organizations that are not directly controlled by. Uh, Red Hat, uh, such as uh, Camel Quarkus, where I'm active, that is under Apache Foundation or even Datastax or Hazelcast. And third, there's a Quarkiverse. Quark Quarkiverse um, is an incubate, incubator and hosting for community extensions. If you feel there's some library or framework missing on Quarkus, you may go there, you may ask for, for a new repository, and somebody from Quarkus team creates it for you. Uh, they give you some, some basic CI setup and some basic uh, good practices, how you should start, and you can start coding. And in this way, there already is a bunch of uh, interesting uh, extensions being uh, developed and maintained there, such as, I don't know, CXF, uh, FreeMaker, and so on. Now, how Quarkus works? Uh, the center part is played by Quarkus tooling in form of Maven or Gradle plugin. And that tooling takes your application code as its input. And what it basically does is that it generates some classes on top of your application classes based on some, some analysis of your code. And that generated classes basically do two things. First, uh, it's, the, it's a bootstrap sequence for your application. And second, it's the configuration for, for GraalVM. And because uh, this is all good old bytecode, it can be run on a stock JVM such as Hotspot, or you can pass it to GraalVM native compiler, and the result is a platform-specific native executable. If you do it on Linux, it's a Linux uh, executable. If you do it on Windows or Mac, it's a, a Mac or Windows-specific uh, executable. So it's, this is really important to, 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 uh, to realize that Quarkus has two modes of operations. First, the JVM mode, and second, the native mode. You can use both depending on your needs. Uh, the JVM one is faster, faster to compile, but uh, has a bit uh, larger memory footprint at runtime and takes a bit, a bit more time to boot at runtime than this one, but this one is uh, much slower to compile. Even for a basic uh, Quarkus application, this may take a minute. And depending on how much extensions you packed in, it could be even more. So you don't want your uh, development iterations to take minutes. And that's why while you are developing, you go this way. And when you are ready, you might uh, decide to go native. OK? Okay, so I think we have said this, and now let's have a look at the native compilation. So if you are using GraalVM native compiler directly, it looks like this. You invoke the native image command and you pass your application code uh, as an argument and optionally also your dependencies. Uh, the result is uh, an executable, which demonstrates on Linux by having this X uh, permission. It might be this small, depending on how much dependencies you have. And when you start it, it might start this fast. And when you check how much memory the project uh, consumes, it might be this low, like 12 megabytes uh, only. These are the good parts, but what are the limitations? 
The first and the most important one is the so-called closed world assumption. It means that all runtime code has to be known at build time. There is a very strong limitation, but it allows uh, the GraalVM compiler to be very aggressive when it comes to uh, elimination of that code. And that's why it's able to make the resulting native image smaller, and that's why also uh, why the memory consumption is, is much better. Because when you are loading classes, that class data, uh, the, the, the code, the method codes, uh, code, that is occupying memory. And if you eliminate code uh, from classes, you spend less memory. What uh, disadvantages or what limitations does this import impose on your uh, applications? So generally, uh, deploying jars, wars, and so on at runtime is not possible because deploying wars is loading classes and it's, it would be adding new code. And that's why it's uh, basically not possible to port a traditional uh, serverless container to GraalVM unless you compile both the container and the application together. Then all code is known at build time and the result contains everything needed. Good, then um, normally uh, the compiler would analyze the code uh, through the execution paths, right? Uh, it would be able to figure out which methods are not reachable and which are, but uh, reflection might fool it by adding new dynamic uh, code, uh, code paths into the, the, the static ones. And to overcome this, uh, GraalVM compiler wants you to register reflection and dynamic proxies and other st stuff upfront so that it can count this way of invoking code in, right? Next thing uh, is class initializers. Um, originally, by default, Gra GraalVM compiler uh, used to prefer uh, in, uh, running the class initializers at build time, only once. And why so? Uh, because when they are called just once, not only the time is saved at runtime, that they are not called again, but also the space is, uh, the memory space is saved again because uh, that code doesn't need to be included into the runtime image at all. Uh, but then gradually GraalVM itself uh, started changing this default to, to runtime for end user classes, but Quarkus kept this uh, default uh, till today with uh, the justification that it improves the boot time and, and the memory footprint. But there's, there is uh, some cost to it. Again, you have to uh, marked, mark some classes that do bad things at, uh, at the initialization time or in their static initializers uh, with some special annotations or other configuration options so that GraalVM doesn't run those uh, initializers at build time. So what, bad, what, what could happen? Uh, which, which situations are not safe for being run uh, at build time? Well, in the first place, um, where do I have it? Here. In the first place, those are resources that are not available at build time at all, like uh, configuration files. Uh, or accessing files generally is not a good idea, then opening network sockets or starting threads because these things you usually really want to do at runtime because they are there for serving uh, end user requests. Another good example for this is uh, the initialization of random number generators. So, and what I didn't say is uh, GraalVM runs all those initializers during the compilation at build time, and then it's able to take a snapshot of the build time JVM where all those classes are initialized already, and they are completely resolved. There no, there's no need uh, to check again which class depends on which other class, 
and to figure out in which order do they need to be loaded. And uh, the whole memory uh, region is just copied to the uh, native image. And at runtime, it's just copied back to the memory and it's there. That's why booting GraalVM native images is that fast. Good. Uh, again, when you work uh, with native image command directly, you might end up with this many uh, configuration options. Some of those are JSON files, which contain tens of entries of uh, file uh, of, of Java classes or methods that need to be registered for reflection. And uh, Quarkus is shielding you from this uh, very well. Compiling native basically means adding uh, minus p native into Maven command, and that ex activates all those uh, native uh, native image configuration for you that is done by Quarkus extensions. Good. Now let's have a look at how to write uh, Quarkus extensions. Um, as you may uh, understand already, Quarkus extension is a unit of Quarkus distribution which uh, packages some specific library framework or an aspect of uh, application programming. Uh, every Quarkus extension con uh, consists of two Maven artifacts. One is uh, the minus deployment one, which is the build time code, and the second one is the without deployment, which is the runtime module. Okay? These runtime modules are the ones that you depend on in your applications. You have to add them, add them as dependencies. And these ones are discovered auto automatically by Quarkus tooling, depending on, on this one. So Quarkus tooling is basically able to find the associated deployment module for every uh, normal runtime module. Uh, at the Maven level, the build time module depends on the runtime module. And uh, the build time module uh, contains uh, these build steps which we are going to talk about now. Build steps are packaged in, the, in processor classes, that's just a convention, and you are producing uh, builds, or you uh, annotate methods with, with build step, right? And build steps are typically producing build items, and build item is uh, a simple data class that just holds some, some payload. In this case, it's a name, and the name is passed uh, through, through, the, through the constructor. And in this way, we have produced a name built, built item holding the name Joe. Some build steps may consume other uh, built items, like, like in this case, the hello step is consuming the name hello, uh, the name uh, build item, and it's combining it uh, into new hello build item. So the we have we have produced the name build item like this, and then we are consuming it like this, and we are producing something new based on it. And now, how does this work together? There's something called uh, Quarkus build time container that. Uh, pulls all these build step methods out of the deployment modules that are available in the application. And it's able to figure out in which order to call these methods based on the dependencies on the build item level between those uh, methods. So if something is con consuming something else produced but by some other methods, then the methods need to be ca called in order. Good. Uh, in the previous slide, we, have, we were showing the, 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 the simplest uh, situation where one uh, build, uh, build step method was consuming a single item and was producing a single item, right? But uh, more complicated scenarios are possible. You can consume multiple and produce mul multiple as well. If you want to produce multiple, you don't need to return from the method. You can just use... Uh, this, this build producer uh, method 
that gets injected by the build time uh, container into your method. And you can, you can pass the produced code, the produced items uh, using the produced method. Good, these were the basics, the primitives. And now let's have a look uh, how we could use it for something useful. It is really very common inside Quarkus extensions to register something for reflection. And typically it's done based on some uh, annotations that are present in the application code. So what we want to do is to find classes annotated by some specific annotation and register them for reflection. We would do it using Jandex. Jandex is a Java annotation indexer. It's an offline Java annotation indexer, which means it's able to analyze the classes and um, output and make, make the annotations queryable without loading those classes, because it's much faster to analyze the bytecode than to load the classes. And um, either the Jandex file is already present in the, in the jar or in the code, or it can be done at build time by Quarkus tooling without you having to care. Uh, Quarkus um, provides a special build item through which you can query uh, the, the annotation index. It's called combined index build item, and it just contains everything we need to look at. So uh, in this example, we want to find all JSON deserialized classes, um, all classes annotated with JSON deserialized annotation that comes from uh, Jackson. And we do it like the following. So we take the uh, in uh, combined index uh, build item, we query by class name, JSON deserialize is just a specific representation of, of the annotation class name. And then we need to do some filtering uh, because we are only interested on annotation for uh, in annotations on classes, not on methods or fields. And when we already get the list of classes, we just produce a reflective class build item which again is defined by Quarkus and it serves exactly what we said, registering certain class for reflection for GraalVM native compiler. Good, you can use Jandex for more, more things, not just annotation lookups. You can find classes, fields, methods, um, having some annotation, right? And fin classes, also find classes implementing an interface or subclasses of a certain class. You can list fields, methods, and so on. And it's very fast and effective. So, so far we have been speaking about the build time code. Now we are going to speak about the runtime code. And the runtime methods which are packaged uh, in these recorder classes could be thought of as chunks of application bootstrap code. So this is basically how you would like to configure your framework or library. And how are we going to use it? So this is again a class from the build time module and here uh, at the bottom we have a class from the runtime module which is annotated with recorder. We can inject or pass the recorder into the uh, build time method and we can even, even invoke a method of the, of the runtime class. But when you think of it, what is this supposed to be even doing? How can we invoke runtime method at build time? It's in the future. And it's supposed to happen many times on every uh, boot of the application. So what would this call actually do? And the answer is it's not really calling uh, a real method of a real instance of, of this class. It's just recording an invocation of that instance, of, of, of some future instance that will, ex uh, will exist at, at runtime. 
So again, we are recording an invocation. We are not really calling it, and the recorder here at build time, it's just a proxy. It's an instrumented, instrumented object that just records that this was called, okay? And uh, this is the runtime code, and it's not really uh, executed at build time. This is ex executed only at runtime. Good. So what we are then returning from that, that method? We are returning some sort of a handle that wraps some runtime value. But that runtime value is not accessible here in the build time code. It only exists at runtime. And I will show an example how, how it can work here. So in this example, we are creating a camel context, which is a, a central object, object uh, in camel application that keeps, gives you access to some important services of camel. And uh, just, just take a mental note that we had a specific parameter of record here, which is static in it. And I will explain later what it is. So this was a simple, uh, on the previous slide, this was a scenario where we were uh, operating within the same uh, extension. But extensions can uh, depend on each other and can reuse uh, built items and uh, recorders from other extensions. Like in this, uh, in this example, I would like to configure camel context in a certain way. I want to add a listener that will be collecting some metrics. How would I do it? I inject uh, a recorder. This is the build, uh, build time code of MP metrics uh, extensions of Camel. And this is the recorder that belongs to that extension. And I can uh, consume the Camel context build item that comes from another uh, Camel extension. And I can I can use that value at, at runtime here. In the runtime code, I can unpack the wrapper, and there's a real object behind that. And I can call its methods, namely, I can register some listener that will be collecting my metrics. And this is how I do it. Again, I'm doing this on static init time. So this example, would produce a bootstrap sequence like this, where this is just a, just a pseudo code in Java. In reality, this would be a bytecode. It's generated directly in bytecode. But for the sake of, of uh, explaining here now, I have rewritten how, it's, uh, how it is uh, roughly working, right? So this is the bootstrap sequence in a static initializer of some class. And it's happening in a static initializer because the recorder method uh, was annotated here with static init. If it was annotated with runtime init, the code would be placed here in the main method. Because in the main, we can open sockets, read files, and so on. If we don't need anything like that, we can do it in the static initializer. And that would make uh, GraalVM native image faster to boot and needing less memory. So how it works? Here, uh, it, it, it recorded uh, an invocation of this method. Oops. And then it's not looking, it's not unwrapping the value in any way. It's just passing the, the value to another method of other extension that happens after the first invocation. And inside that method, we can already unwrap the uh, the, the handle and do something with the camel context. Okay. And if you want to open a socket, we would do it in the main method. Good. I hope you are still with me. And uh, here I have listed some very commonly used built items. Uh, we have already seen reflective class built items, but there are others like for working with CDI container of Quarkus, where you want to register beans having some specific annotation or uh, registering beans that are 
uh, looked up using other criteria, like you, you would want to uh, register something as a bean that is a subclass of some class or imp implement some uh, interface and so on. There's also extensions, SSL native support built item that is handy if you want uh, SSL to be working in native mode. You just have to uh, produce this built item and Quarkus takes care for the rest. Uh, then we have the Jandex built items that we have sold already. And there's native image resource built item for registering um, registering resources that needs to be included in the native image because GraalVM is not including anything by default. If you want HTML templates, images, whatever in your resulting uh, native image, you need to do it somehow. But generally, uh, the extensions are taking care for this out of the box without end user having to care. Good, the next step is uh, extension configurations. Extensions very often expose configuration through annotated pojos. Uh, they can come in three flavors depending on when the given piece of configuration is available. Some configuration uh, makes sense only at build time and some configuration makes sense uh, at runtime also but maybe cannot be changed. We need to read it at runtime, but we don't want it to be changeable because it's compiled in somehow uh, into the native image. So how would we do it? So we want, uh, we want um, a configuration parameter like this, camel main enabled, uh, which is a Boolean, and we would have to create a pojo called camel config, uh, annotated with something like this, and then there would be some, some middle ground class uh, that would be implementing the main um, segment of the, of the property name, and then there's the enabled uh, property. If we have this, we can use this configuration as follows uh, in, a, in a build time code, doing something, uh, con uh, conditional uh, given the, the configuration parameter is true. Or we can pass that same configuration instance to, uh, to, build, uh, to runtime code where we also can do something based on it. Because uh, this was built and runtime fixed, if we have this piece of code there, it's, it's a static value, it's a constant for GraalVM native compiler. And if this happens to be false at build time, if end user configures this to be false, then GraalVM is ab able to throw away this whole close and the code is simply not there, which is very nice. Can lead to uh, faster boot times and uh, smaller uh, memory footprint. Good. Uh, that was about configuration, and you could you can use uh, you can do something similar using uh, microprofile config API uh, by by uh, looking up the property as a string. Good. Then the substitutions uh, they are provided by GraalVM, and they are actually the last resort for fixing something. Uh, in classes that are not under your control. If, if you have done no better cho choice, uh, you can use uh, substitutions, but if you have better choices, you should use those. Why so? Because substitutions are rather hard to maintain over a long time, because the, the class you are fixing might be changed in a, a very, very detailed, small ways, and your substitution is not going to match anymore. So, for example, you might want to fix some class not to open a socket in a static initializer. And I have an example for this. I don't know if it's still the case, but about, I think, two years ago, this was a code from MySQL JDBC driver. And it was starting a thread that would be cleaning, cleaning, cleaning up stale connections. 
and uh, using a thread, and the thread was starting uh, started in a static initializer. So how would we fix it? If we would create a substitution class that would be targeting that class from the JDBC driver, we would have no static initializer there, and we would replace some method from that original class by doing nothing. And that thread would simply not be started in native mode, and who cares, right? There would be just no automatic cleaning of stale uh, connections, which is a good uh, workaround. Good, these are topics that I haven't covered in these presentations. Uh, there's a whole uh, area of generating bytecode directly using library called Gizmo. It's very funny. It's, uh, I actually like it. I do it from time to time, but uh, it's a rather advanced topic. Uh, if you are porting your first library and if it's rather something simple just to register something for reflection and so on, you don't need this. Uh, then I haven't covered how to add developer UI that I have shown at the beginning to an extension, and I haven't covered uh, extension testing at all. But uh, if you check this presentation, which is available on my blog, uh, you can follow this link, and it explains the topic very well. Uh, that was it for today. Um, I hope you got learned that writing uh, Quarkus extensions basically means two things. First, to shrink and speed up the application uh, by expecting, uh, inspecting the application code, by querying uh, annotations, by writing some annotation uh, application bootstrap code. <clears throat> and secondly, by making the GraalVM native compiler happy, by registering uh, classes or methods for reflection, by registering proxies, JNIs, resources, and writing substitutions. That's it for today. Here are some useful links. Thank you very much. <laughs>